Thank you so much, Tina. Thank you, Chris. Tina, you lit your match again, didn't you? Thank you. Welcome to Seal Beach in the month of May. So I thought I was going to have to explain to you what divine empowerment was, but several people have given it a shot. And let me give you the philosophical, my philosophical definition. It's that wonderful power and presence where we can reach into that divine mind that we've never touched before. And we can supercharge our life and bring the bliss and the joy and the compassion from on high into our life and other people's lives. So the topic today is honoring our value. And Reverend Nicole, in just a few minutes, is going to share with you some of the greater CSL visions and missions and values from the CSL movement. But what came to me today is that how quickly values change and how we deal with this concept of change. Because there's a, uh, Wayne Dyer had a very apt saying, there's nothing as powerful as an idea whose time has come. And we're seeing changes drastically different, almost exponentially, than we have before. And I want to share with you a couple of personal experiences that demonstrate that to me. So when I became a minister and got my official minister's license, the one thing I did that I'd been wanting to for some time is I went and became a teen advisor at our worldwide teen, teen camp in Idlewild. And I just got my minister's license, and you know, that takes nine or 10 years to study overall. And I went there, and at the training session, I realized I was woefully, woefully uneducated <laughs> on the concept of gender identity. <laughs> and, um, and, and what you do with gender identity, what's respectful. The one thing I have learned when I don't know a lot about something, I keep my mouth shut about it. <laughs> so I took my copious notes, and I like, to, I like to surround myself with people who do know a lot of things about it. So I went and buddied up with a couple of 10-year advisors, and they taught me the things. And you know, I did my earnest effort all week to, to make sure I was honoring everyone. And when I didn't know what to do, I got guidance and everything like that. <laughs> but 20 years ago, that wouldn't, wouldn't have even been on my radar and probably not on anyone's radar. That's how quickly things change. And I'm thinking back, it seems not too long ago for me, um, when I was growing up. And my mom was raised in a small town called Port Gibson, Mississippi, which was 90% African American in population. And my dad was raised in Detroit, Michigan. And doing the normal thing, my dad went to honor my mom to go get married to her in her hometown in the early 50s. My dad was for a rude awakening because back in the 50s, the race relations in Detroit, Michigan were a whole lot different than they were in rural Mississippi. So he had that awakening. And this was one of our favorite vacation places for my brother and myself. We would go there, and we would get to play in the woods, swim in the swimming hole. And our favorite thing, there was like acres and acres of wild blackberries. And so we, we would gather those blackberries, bring them home to my great-grandmother, and she would bake us this knockout five-layer blackberry cobbler. <laughs> and, but you know, it was then, and then there was one day, we, it was in the mid-60s, and my mom gathers my brother and I, and I look at my mom, and I see a face I haven't seen on her for a while. Both in her face and in her eyes, I saw fear. And she says, Russell and Michael, we're going to visit your grandmother in Jackson. You do not say a word to anyone. Because the racial relations were in turmoil around that weekend. And so that's just an example of snapshots. So when we become set in our ways about what change is and what it isn't, we're looking with snapshots. So after that time, look at all the power and the progress we've made for equality, for rights, for people of all races, 
and people of all sexual orientation. And we're on our way to doing the same thing for people with all gender identities. And I challenge you and I ask you that, that you open yourself up and let that change, whose time has come, happen to pass. And so, you know, when we're parents, what do we do? We try our best to train our kids on our vision to make it for themselves and live a good and productive life and a happy life. But we're dealing with the snapshot. So my parents did their best. They didn't know what I was going to have 40 years from now. So we all do our best. <coughs> but change, what really causes change is the evolution of consciousness. The only thing that will never change is consciousness will evolve. It will push us to do things, to, to be in ways that we've never, never been before. And if we're in the midst of change, we dig our heels in, we don't participate in it, we push back on it, typically what's going to happen is something not so very good for us. It's like we're standing against a river of change and saying, no, I won't participate in it. So what can we do to do things a little different? It's like uh, the time I spent with my shaman in Aruba, he says, let me show you a different way of looking at that. What we can use when we're dealing with change is we can build spiritual bridges. What do these spiritual bridges do? They turn breakdown into breakthrough. They turn resistance and pain into showing the way forward. And these spiritual bridges we can build, because what is a bridge anyway? It's a, it's a structure that takes us from where we are to where we need to be. And the evolution of consciousness is pushing us forward to everything that is more livingness, less judgment. So we need these bridges. But we need to build these bridges smarter. Not smarter in the book sense. I'm an engineer. I could figure out all the, all the moments and stresses. No, we need to build them smarter where we can get into this divine empowerment. So as we see the world, you can picture it as the big pie. They told me after the first service to use a blackberry pie from my earlier <laughs> state. Um, there's a little sliver of that pie that you know very well and you hang out in all the time. That's that part of the universe that you live in and have your experience in and you know everything about it. And then there's another sliver of that pie right beside it that's a little fuzzy. You're aware of it, but that's that part of you that you know that you don't know. So you don't know what it is, but you, you're aware that you don't know what it is. And the rest of the pie, this huge, large piece of the pie, is that part of the pie that you don't know what you don't know. And that is where the world of possibility is. That is where the world of grace is. That is where the world of divine empowerment lies. Because we want to invent something, create something better than we've ever, ever seen before. We're not going to rely on the way things used to be. We want to create something better. But when we go to accept this change, we have some defense mechanisms. First one is we pretend that it's not happening. Oh, this couldn't be happening in my lifetime. If you want change, want me to change, I'll have to go, but it'll be kicking and screaming and digging my heels in. But that's not honoring us. And then there's a resistance called clinging. And Ram Das tells us this. When we cling to that which changes, we suffer. And why is that? Because everything that's created in the world is created at a certain point in time. And when that no longer has a usefulness, guess what happens to it? It crumbles to it. So, you know, God bless my parents for telling me the way life was 40 years ago. They had all the great intentions. But that's not the way it is now. So I can cling to something in the past 
but maybe I have to understand that consciousness is evolving and it's pushing ever forward into the future. And I can be part of that beautiful future instead of resisting that bigger, that beautiful picture. And the last one is just plain resisting. Once again, kicking and screaming, I'm not going to be a part of it. Or you can be a little bit more proactive. You can address this change and be part of birthing this change. But to birth this change, you have to make way for the new to have a place to come. So to birth this change, sometimes you have to give up on your false beliefs of the past, or maybe not just false beliefs, or beliefs that no longer have their way. As Dr. Dyer said, an idea, nothing is as powerful as an idea whose time has come. Well, this idea that I'm talking about today, my parents couldn't have told me about 40 years ago because it wasn't time. But everything is going to change, and you can be proactive and be part of that. And the thing that happens to us all, it's sort of like losing a loved one or a fond pet. We go through a grieving experience. We all grieve. I mean, I have these great memories of growing up in Irving, Texas, and riding my bike through trails and, and roads. And maybe if I saw four cars a day, that was a lot. <laughs> so we all have this part of us that we grieve. But you know what the best thing about grieving is? What generated the grieving in the first place? What generated the grieving in the first place was love. The love that you had for that. And that's not going away. So instead of thinking about what you've lost, think about that essence of love that created it. And let that essence of love steer you through this new situation steer you through these brave new waters that we're facing. It's that essence of love that's going to bring us there. And so to close, I want to ask you to be open to change, but to do something better. I want you to have courage. The first aspect of courage I want you to have is the courage to face the change. In the animal world, all the, story, all the studies have told us is those species that face change head on, rather than turning their back to it, did much, much well. And then I want you to embrace, have the courage to embrace the change. Stop digging your heels in and befriend the change. Even if you don't know where it's going to go, stop and embrace that change and at least take a ticket on the ride. And the third, and it's the most empowering, the most important in my mind, I want you to grace the change. This is where you're getting into the world of possibility, of grace, of love, of joy, of compassion, of creating something that has never been done before. What you're doing is you're allowing yourself to go with this new thought that you don't even know what it is yet. And you're bringing that grace of God that acts through you into this beautiful situation that is change, that is just the evolution of consciousness, always pushing forward, always pushing forward with grace, with joy, with bliss. And all we can do is we can go back to the way things were or we can join and go forward to a future more beautiful than we can possibly imagine. Thank you. That was beautiful, Reverend Michael. That was beautiful. That was great. Thank you. I think you left this quote out that's really nice by Ernest Thomas. Huh, maybe we'll do it at the end. So, who here can tell me what the overall Centers for Spiritual Living around the world's global vision is? A world that works for everyone. Yes, a world that works for everyone. That's a vision. 
visions are meant to be big. They're meant to be always something that we're working towards, okay? Now, can anybody say what our mission is? Not ours here, but our, ours as in the entire Centers for Spiritual Living. Do you know what our mission is? Pam? To awaken humanity to its spiritual magnificence. Can you say that with me? To awaken humanity to its spiritual magnificence. Does that sound like something you want to be a part of? Yeah? Does that sound like, oh, yeah, I'm on board? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, except that that's a lot of work. If we want to work, we, if we want to live in a world that works for everyone, that means all those people that make us uncomfortable too. That means all those people who have ideas that we think are crazy. That means all those people who think that they're going to go to heaven because they, uh, you know, kill an American. That means all those people who are disrespecting and hurting us. It means coming together and first looking at ourselves, at what's triggering us, at where we need to grow and learn in order to be an example of what could be possible, right? How do people ever learn how to grow? By an example. By someone showing them how, that it's possible, right? I learned how to sew by somebody on YouTube teaching me, right? I'm just saying, hey, we're on Facebook Live. If you want to learn how to, uh, you know, awaken humanity to its spiritual magnificence, just stay here and we'll, we'll be examples for you. It's, it's like that. It's showing people. It's being real. It's being honest. And it's taking ourselves seriously enough, consciously enough to say, hey, where am I feeling uncomfortable? What about that human being be being that human being does something inside of me, makes me want to walk the other way. These are hard, hard things. And we want, we, um, I, okay, I, want to just believe that everything's fine and that we're all working towards it and, and, and we all have the best intentions. And we might have the best intentions, but are we ever called on our stuff? Are we ever asked to really look at ourselves and what our, our thoughts and beliefs and bias are? Because that's what it's going to take for us to really look at ourselves and say, can I be, how can I open my heart enough, open my mind enough, open my idea of what life looks like, the status quo is enough, to be open to new ideas, to new possibilities, to new ways of being, and to find value in them. I was thinking about that when I was inspired to share this with you, that our talk title is honoring the value, honoring our value, honoring others' value. But how do I get you to honor it if I don't even know what you find value in, you know? If you don't have value in another human being, then what, what's the point of me asking you to honor their value, right? But there is one thing that we all have in common. Remember a few months ago when I shared that, that, um, that uh, statistic from the anthropologist about how she did this study and what, she, what it was concluded was that every single person on this earth is at its furthest most reaches everybody else's 50th cousin. So in that sense, we're all kin. We're all brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers. And brother. We're all cousins okay and I value my cousins I value my family I know we all get to choose our family sometimes too and I choose you and I value you I don't care how different you are I don't care how bizarre you are I like you I get it and so what I want to do this morning remember last week I said that I had talked to some teens and they wanted to share a little bit about their lives with us Haley shared last week about her experience of the, the dichotomy that goes on inside of her. And now this morning I want to share an experience from another teen. His name is Drew. And let me get a drink real quick. 
It's just the, it's the experience that he goes through in his life right now. And I wonder if we can just, while listening to his experience, open our hearts, open our minds, and just be, just be with it. He says, I know that when you look at me, you may see a trans guy, but I am more than that. I am an artist, a shark enthusiast, a lover of sweaters and soups. Yes, I am transgender, but I am also a lot of other things. I am conflicted between two existences. In many aspects, my gender identity runs my life. It wasn't even something I got to choose. And yet, and yet, it has changed everything. My gender and sexuality police where I get to hang out, where I can feel safe, how I can make certain decisions, and what my future will look like. Because many of the people treat me differently. Sometimes it feels like I'm wearing a giant sign that says, I'm different. Often I'm seen as that token trans person, that example of resilience for the cis-straight community. And cis-straight means um, that you identify with the gender that you are born with. So people who are female and identify as female. So that the trans is the, the token for courage and, and strength from the cis-straight people to idolize. People tell me that I'm brave for being who I am, but I never knew how to respond to that because how is it, I wouldn't have to be brave if I was accepted. I wouldn't have to be brave if I was just accepted. For me, transitioning had been fairly easy. As soon as I was able to, I cut my hair and I changed my clothes and I imme immediately passed fairly well for a male. It's so easy to cut some hair or buy some new clothes. The hard part, the part that made me cry, the part that made me afraid, the part that I had to be brave for was coming out. It was so scary to not know how people would react if I was still going to have a family or not, if I was still going to have my close friends or not. And when I came out, I was launched directly into a war that had been going on for decades, the fight for human rights. I feel like I had to just join the battle. The trans and gay communities both have endured never-ending injustice, particularly in the last century. We have been fighting so long and so hard against an enemy that is ever-changing and growing in size and power. I am only one person, but I do the best I can. I answer people's questions, often even if they make me uncomfortable. I come out in settings that scare me simply so that there is finally some trans representation there. My gender identity and sexuality are things that I did not choose for myself. No more than anyone chooses the color of their skin or the disabilities they have. I was born with them. I cannot change them. They have no more power over me than I them. They have more power over me than I them. However, some people seem to think that I'm faking it, like I would choose to feel like I'm trapped in the wrong body, like I would choose to feel like I needed to spend thousands of dollars just to feel like okay in my skin, like I would choose to be called names, choose to be disrespected, to be asked inappropriate questions as if my transness makes me less than human, like I would choose to always be almost something in everybody's eyes. I wish it was a choice, that I could just choose to not be so different, but I can't. I try my best to just be seen as Drew, to correct people, 
to correct people politely, to ignore the misgendering or the judgment when I can't do anything about it. But no matter how well I pass or how well I adjust, I cannot deny that being trans changes everything. That's what Drew wrote. And so what I want to, what, what I was reminded of was um, this activist, he was a, a pessimist in the 1800s, his name was Arthur Schopenhauer. And he had said once, he said, all truth passes through three phases. All truth passes through three phases. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. And third, it is accepted as self-evident. Who does that remind you of? That reminded me of Jesus, right? And, and, and all of the communities that come out that are different, right? Jesus, too, was a rebel. He wanted to do things his own way. He, did, he, did, he didn't want to buy into what the high priests were talking about, so he did things his own way. And then he was ridiculed by his family, by his friends, by his uh, community. And then he was violently opposed, so violently that he was murdered. And then, and then, it was accepted as self-evident what he was trying to tell them all. And then, right? What this says to me, what this reminds me, is that we as a community, we as a consciousness, we as a collective humanity need to do something. We, what we need to do is to just get curious, to just start asking, asking a lot of questions. When there's things that we don't understand, it's OK to say, can you tell me a little bit more about that? When there's things that we don't get, we don't have to just turn away. We can say, hey, I, I, don't, I don't understand. I remember we were driving back from teen camp, um, from winter camp, and I had not known Drew very well. And I said, you know, I don't really get all this, all these different words and everything. Can you, can you just break it down for me? Because I really don't understand. There's this cisgender, non-binary, binary, binary uh, uh, there's a whole bunch of words that I don't get. And he just, he just told me. He taught me. He, 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 I was ignorant, and he informed me so that I could, I could have intelligence, so I could be informed. And then I could understand. And it's just like with anything else, right? Um, why, uh, why, it, why is suicide so strong in seniors? It's insane. Why is it so high in seniors? Because of the loneliness. Did you know that 40% of senior citizens are left alone longer than a week at a time without a phone call from anyone? <sighs> so if somebody uh, cuts you off in line at the grocery store, and they seem a little agitated or frustrated, and they're an elderly person, maybe you want to ask them, hey, what's going on? Are you okay? Because there might be deep things going on within them. And, and, and what, like black lives matters. Ask, why do black lives matter instead of all lives? Because all lives have always mattered, but black lives have never mattered as much as other lives for as long as we've been here. Okay? If we want a world that works for everyone, and if we say that we are an open and inclusive in community that recognizes and honors people on all walks of life, then we have to start stepping up and moving into it. And it can be as easy as saying, I don't understand. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? I don't get it. I don't know. I I've never been there. This is how we do it. This is how we begin to honor the value of each and every human being. <sighs> I'm just going to close there.
good place to stop. And so I'm going to pray. And I just recognize the power that's in this room, the power of transformation, of consciousness, of rising as one. Recognizing that oneness does not mean sameness, that the diversity of life is the flavor, it is the color, it is the excitement and joy of knowing that there are so many kinds of kinds of God beings on this earth. And how good it is to open our hearts and our minds and our ears and our eyes to the beauty of spirit. And for gratitude, gratitude for being a part of a community who desires, who desires to support. I am so grateful. And so it is.